At the time, I think the, the ratio was that 26 out of 12, 27 new companies failed. It would really be meaningful to me and something that I would really have a lot of passion for and about. And uh, so that's where it started and away we went. What kind of person was Phil Knight back at the GSB? How would you have described yourself? I took the entrepreneurship class from uh, Frank Schellenberger and basically the, the project, he had a term project where you basically either attach yourself to a company in the area or for the purpose of the paper made up a company and, and how it would succeed. Even in those days a lot of my classmates were writing about electronics which was certainly beyond me since when I turn on a light bulb, when I turn on an electric switch, the light bulb comes on, it's magic for me. My old track coach was always uh, working with shoes and that uh, felt that, uh, you know, a light, lightweight in shoes was something that was neglected by the major manufacturers at Edis and Puma. And indeed, my senior year, Otis Davis won the uh, Pacific Coast Conference Championship in a pair of homemade Bowerman shoes, which were an ounce lighter, lighter than the other shoes. So I kind of put those things together and, and said, if you were starting a shoe factory, would you start it in Germany? And I said, it's such a labor-intensive business, it makes more sense to start it in Japan. Japan being the country that uh, took German cameras and, and uh, dominated the camera market. Says, could they do the same thing in sports shoes? And that was really the thesis of the paper, which ultimately I got caught up in, and here we are. What gave you the confidence to push ahead? When I wrote the paper, it, it, uh, it just stayed in my head. And at the time, I think the, the ratio was that 26 out of 12, 27 new companies failed. So I knew the odds weren't high, but I really began to feel if I could do this, that would, uh, would really be meaningful to me and something that I would really have a lot of passion for and about. That's where it started and away we went. You're selling shoes out of the trunk of your car. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have doubts in those moments and what was it that kept you going? Well, obviously there were a lot of doubts. I enjoyed what I was doing and I really thought that uh, I was bringing a product uh, to the world that uh, was better than the other product. So I believed, and, uh, and if you read the book, uh, it wasn't too long before I had a bunch of other people that believed as well. Through all the ups and downs, and there were plenty of downs that uh, we never stopped believing. And a lot of people say, why did you stay with it? There were a lot of negative moments and a lot of downturns. And, and I look back on those days, the most fun I ever had in business. Every Monday you went to work and you knew it mattered what you did including whether you're going to meet payroll on Friday. But uh, it was a, an exciting time and uh, Frank Schallenberger had done a wonderful job of preparing us for, you know, being an entrepreneur. Bob Davis, a marketing professor, said if you're going to be an entrepreneur, he said every day is a crisis and every Friday is a Jesus crisis. I, I believe that, uh, that, that it was a good idea. I, I believe that uh, if we could get a cooperative Japanese factory that uh, they could make the idea work introvert, why well, uh, you basically have to, you have to believe, you have to overcome the shyness to, uh, to take certain chances and uh, I was willing to do that. You know, there were a lot of ups and downs but uh, ultimately it worked and uh, you know, I think at the end of the day you got to believe and, that, and that's what I did have maybe above everything else. Mackey's culture is a big uh, part of its reason for success and the culture really was formed in the early days by the, by the four people plus me. Uh, and uh, it still exists to this day. They used Barman's word attitude, they came within a certain attitude. And, uh, and it was sort of us, that's who we were. And uh, the culture has been modified some, and which is a good thing. And, uh, but it's still kind of basically there and I think it's a big part of its strength. I hope that that culture is, uh, is basically in place, you know, 20 years from now. It fits with sort of our view uh, then and now about what a brand is. You know, it doesn't matter how many people hate your brand, as long as enough people love it. As long as you have that out, you can't be afraid of offending people. You can't try and go down the middle of the road. You have to take a stand on something. We signed him for more than any rookie had been paid before. We signed him for $250,000 a year. And Fortune Magazine ran a little insert uh, and another article says, there's no greater indication that Nike has lost its way than the fact that they paid Michael Jordan $250,000. <laughs> Combined it with uh, uh, our, our, what we thought was a really good shoe, a really distinctive shoe. It was red and black. It wasn't just white or black. And uh, of course, he wore it to, uh, great, in great performances. And then we had the added benefit of David Stern Bandit in the NBA. So we immediately combined what became a good ad, said banned in the NBA and every kid in the world wanted that. It hasn't been straight uphill. It had a one year where our sales actually went down, but 
overall that was the what we got together with was really good advertising which reflected his personality which was strong it's been an unbelievable success that uh, when he quit playing uh, sales of Jordan brand product were 750 million dollars and this last fiscal year they topped three billion dollars how does a brand stay so relevant to so many people for so long? You have to work at it all the time, but I think, you know, our thing obviously, it, it starts with the product. The, the product is by far our most, marketing, uh, our most important marketing tool, and so we're constantly working to improve product. The recent upturn is because we've had a really good product pipeline. Um, probably the React uh, running shoe is uh, you know, number one on the list, but there have been a lot of others. And uh, good advertising is, is, is critical to it, that uh, keeping the product fresh and keeping the advertising fresh. And it's an ongoing challenge, and uh, we don't always hit it. You know, a couple years ago we took a little dip, and uh, it's a very, very competitive business. And, uh, and every six months is kind of a new life, and everybody has to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Introverted people have a tendency to listen, which I think uh, good leaders do. But when I was in school, that uh, you know, they talked about two different types of leadership. They talked about autocratic leadership and, and democratic leadership. And you know, it was only uh, 15 years after World War II, and you know, they had uh, two of the great autocratic leaders ever, Douglas MacArthur and George Patton. And uh, they, at the time, looked, were looked on as being very successful. That uh, then you have a democratic style leadership, which is uh, the you know, other thing is, is getting people involved and, and talking to people. It, it's probably almost impossible for uh, uh, an introvert to be an autocratic leader, uh, but an introvert can be a democratic leader. And as the, the idea of democratic leadership progressed, this is the, the, uh, they started to talk, use the term collaborative leadership, which is really, in my view, the ultimate and only kind of leadership to this day. That in this day and age, the autocratic leader doesn't work. It, it can work for temporarily, but it won't work long run. And I hope that the people in this, in this auditorium today don't get the idea that hero leadership means being autocratic. Steve Jobs is looked at as really kind of, in this area, one of, and the whole world really, as being one of the great leaders, which I believe he was. But I do believe at the end of his career, he was beginning to modify his you know, natural autocratic style which, if you will, got him fired his first tour around uh, uh, Apple. And as he got to go through Apple the second time, there was a change in Steve Jobs. And uh, you notice that from the commencement speech he gave to, uh, to Stanford University. And, and he hired Tim Cook, and he had a lot of give and take with Tim Cook. And Tim Cook, uh, who I know quite well, is very much a collaborative leader. And, and I believe a great collaborative leader. The only style of leadership that will work in this day and age uh, is, is collaborative leadership. Because communications really is a kind of an individual thing. Everybody's a little bit different. It's like people have different fingerprints, they have different personalities, they have different emotions. And I think the leader's job is to know who his team is. And there's different ways to communicate with that team. Great shoes are made by great factories. You don't want a, you know, a, a, you know, a bad factory making your, your, the best shoes in the world. You gotta have a niche, you gotta have a reason to succeed. My reason that was that you know, Japan could make uh, shoes economically. I do think if you're going to be an entrepreneur, it has to be something that you really love because there will be a lot of dark days. And as I say, we never hesitated in those bark, dark days. So I, I was fortunate enough to find what I thought was a niche to go with my passion. And that's, that's what you need to bring those two things together. But when you do, you're very, very fortunate and take advantage of it. And a lot of people say, why did you stay with it? There were a lot of negative moments and a lot of downturns. And, and I look back on those days, the most fun I ever had in business. Sometimes you just have to be fearless enough to break the simulation. I think it's good that when I had my first complete blackout at age five, my mom didn't fully medicate me.